It's always nice to be back in Poland. I've been a visitor at least 15 times, especially in my early days. I spent some time in the Nesky Institute, working with uh, Bogoslav Czernicki, any of those you remember them? I remember Zielinski also, uh, met many, many, many other roles, of course. And I published two papers in ACTA, Neurobiology Experimental. <laughs> and in those days, I was particularly interested in behavior. And that was one of the reasons why I came to the Nancy Institute, because there were many outstanding people who were studying behavior. Now, behavior, of course, is a very complex set of categories. So before we can start the dialogue, I'd like to start with a list of, uh, of items or list of uh, phrases or words. And chances are that most of you here in the room can put yourself under one of these rubrics and say, oh, I'm interested in this and this is what I'm studying and try to find out what it is in the brain and so on. Now, in fact, this is a table of contents of a famous book. I have a, like a, a euro with me. I can give a price to somebody who can tell me <laughs> <laughs> which book is this. In fact, the author was already mentioned today. You are asked probably. <laughs> yeah. So, he is the most prominent and most effective psychologist of our times, William James. So William James came up with these ideas. To his credit, he thought they were ideas. But what happened over time is that these words became codified and became our vocabulary in cognitive neuroscience. Now, the funny thing is that these words were concocted not by him, but by Christian Europe. In fact, before them, Aristotle. Many of the Greeks could have come up with the same exact ideas when you were thinking about what the minds are about. And what happened is, over time, these codified terms became our independent variables, and our task today in cognitive science is to find boxes in the brain, find homes to this, for these terms in the brain, with the same perceived boundaries. This is the most naive thing you can think about, because how is it possible that something concocted by people who had no idea what the brain is about has corresponding mechanisms in the brain. So I call this the outside-in approach. And as opposed to this, our laboratory is going the other way around, and we call it inside-out. So I took a difficult topic to, uh, to illustrate this, which is, uh, well, I just show you a, a, an example. Everybody knows what it is. This is the human and measles approach. What you do is you give signals to the brain. You go inside the brain with your machines, fMRI or microelectrode, and you find correspondences in the brain. And you correlate them, you find correlations, and you are happy and publish data. <laughs> the problem with this approach is that that correlation is available only to you, the experimenter. Because you have access to what's happening outside in the world and what happens inside the brain. Neurons in the brain don't have that luxury. They don't know anything what's happening out. All they see is that they get action potential from the upstream neurons. For example, in lateral geniculate, they receive action potentials from the retina and also upstream. So how on earth the, 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 the brain would know anything about the outside world? And there is one answer to that, that you have to ground this knowledge. And the only way how you can ground the information, the sensory information that comes, up, that comes in, is through behavior, through action. The animal has to have access to its outputs and compare the outputs of this with this computation that happens in the brain. Now, let me, let me try the very simple example. Brains, small and large, are predictive devices. The reason why they can make a speed, the reason why they can predict, is because we live in an environment with regularities. Day comes up the, the night and the, loss of the, the, the stronger is, uh, is always winning, and so on. So we can make predictions. So now we can take a hypothetical little organism, it could be an athesia, it could be a mosquito, or whatever, and what it does usually is generate a internally generated pattern in its brain. As a result of this, it can move, 
generated action and move its sensors and register the consequences of its own actions with the help of the sensor. If it led to some reward, then it increases the probability that next time this organism encounters the same situation, it can already predict and prevent or go ahead and do the action that is needed. So over the evolution what happens is that these brains become a little bit more complicated. We keep adding loops. So for example, we can add a loop here, another loop, and another loop, and another loop. And the brain becomes more and more complicated, but the entire goal of this complication is also to predict the future. But now, to predict the future in a more complex environment and at a much longer time scale. You come to graduate school because you hope that someday you will get a job. There are many, many graduate students and postdoctoral fellows here in Poland, and there are three jobs, I assume. <laughs> so, you know, there is quite a bit of competition. Nevertheless, your investment, you calculate that your, your investment is worth because you will predict what will happen to you down the road. Now, the reason why this can be done is because these loops are very smart. But these loops start getting smarter and smarter and smarter, and at one point, they become so good that they no longer need the external world. They can rely on themselves. And this is the point when the brain starts doing what we call what-if scenarios. What if I go to medical school? What if I become an engineer? What if I become this and this? Without actually going to three schools. Just pretending to think about it. You peek into the computation of your own, of your own brain and figure out what the best probabilities would be based on the information that you gathered before in your life. So in the rest of my talk, everything will be simple. I will just show three of the many possible examples that support this idea. Let's start with the simplest possible one. <coughs> Everybody, every mother knows, every parent mother knows that baby pigs are very important. Baby pigs correlate with a lot of things, including your IQ and your, your by bigger when you, when you are born and so on. But what we don't really know is what they do for the brain. Luckily, the kicks are very important and they can be studied also in small animals. Any of you who have seen a litter of a mouse or, 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 or maybe rest can see that they are a little bit like popcorns. <laughs> and, uh, they are sitting next to each other and every now and then only one muscle, sometimes uh, one limb, but sometimes the entire body starts moving around. Now we are talking because we can put electrodes into the head of these animals and see what is the relationship be between these stochastic looping patterns and brain activity. In fact, the question we asked was slightly different. What we asked was, what is the first organized pattern that emerges in the brain? And we just stumbled upon this observation. And the answer is, the first organized pattern is this. Nothing, 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 and all of a sudden there is a very strong activity here. Now, rodents born, are born prematurely. So when a, when a rat is born, it corresponds to approximately between the second and the third trimester of the pregnancy in humans. They are like premature babies. And in fact, in premature babies, you also see nothing, 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 and all of a sudden, there is a big activity. If you zoom in, what you see is that, uh huh. This is very interesting. It looks like a sleep spindle. It has the same frequency, but it does not with the same duration, the same dynamic, but a different behavioral correlate. Because when you look at the other side and say, oh, this is multi activity and this is movement, you can see that every single, every single of these spindles are associated with one type of movement. Now, at this early age, the organization of the brain or the nervous system is vertical. The IA afferents from the spinal cord go to the thalamus. The thalamocortical fibers are already in place, but the horizontal, long-range connections are not there yet. Subcortical neurotransmitters are not there yet. So what happens is that even though these spindles occur, they just occur like mosaics in complete isolation. And in fact, you can map the entire somatosensory area by watching the different parts of the twitching and look at the relationship. Or in fact you can touch somewhere in the body and then you will find that sometimes in the 
high limb barrier, sometimes the poor limb barrier or face barrier, there will be an activity. Now, what does it buy? We have about 600 or so muscles. And suppose that those muscles were placed in the, on this table, and they will be all connected to the brain. And whenever they twitch, they generate a spindle. That kind of activity buys nothing for the brain. However, all these muscles are connected to the skeletal system. The result of which is that the degree of freedom is decreased tremendously. Those muscles that will work together in the future work together in time. Those muscles that are antagonistic to each other and, and become antagonistic to each other work together in time. So we have about a half a second or so of the spindle time that allows when the long wage connections are coming in, then the connections are coming in at the time that there is activity in those areas that happen to represent the same part of the body. In other words, this is a very, very useful process because it will determine and it will tell the brain through this action, how is your body look like? How do we know when we are born whether your body is a snake shape or a ball shape or the way it is? Moreover, your body changes from day to day, but you like to scratch your nose uh, from one day to another, the distance changes, so you have to update this distance, and this is a mechanism to update. So just to show that indeed this is the same kind of pattern occurs, this is from the from a premature baby, the baby there is nothing here, all of a sudden you've got this the same thing, that, that is very powerful brain activity when uh, movement occurs. So just to summarize, these are the, this is my first example, what happened. Let's, see, let's recapitulate what happened. Initially, the brain is completely dependent on the external environment. You can call it the Newtonian brain. It's waiting for something to energize the brain in order that something will happen. But over time, self-organization takes over, and you no longer need the presence of the twitches. These spindles will occur only during the time when you fall asleep, especially in the Stage, on the stage to sleep. <coughs> but they never disappear. If you go home tonight and you will be in bed, you will observe yourself and yet sometimes you you've got a big startle reaction, you almost fall out of bed. If you would be recording your EEG activity, you would find that at the time there was a spin wave. So this was my first example of internalization of a pattern, in this case, a brain. Now let, let's move to something more concrete. My other two examples are coming from uh, the territory of, of uh, spatial navigation. Everybody knows about the discoveries, and uh, Nobel Prizes were given for this. In order to navigate, you have to generate a map. Well, when you are tourists and you come to New York and you would like to find your, your way, you have a map, you come out from the, the, the subway, the first thing you have to do you have to orient the map in the right direction. If you don't do that, you end up like me. Typically, that I go uptown instead of downtown, and uh, it takes me a long time before I realize what I am. The second thing you have to, to do is that locate things in the environment. For that, you need a grid system. And the third, third thing that you need is you have to locate yourself. And this is what the play cell system is very useful. There is one more thing that is absolutely needed, which is not here, is the calibration of the distances. Because when you move from the subway, it doesn't matter whether you have to walk 15 minutes or 5 hours to your destination. And we don't exactly know what the, the calibration signal is for the distances in the brain, but, but at least we have these three ingredients. So let's start with the simple thing to the head reaction system. In order to do that, we have to record from a large number of neurons simultaneously, because what we would like to do is to see how the neurons cooperate with each other, not only how the external signals correlate with the uh, internal observations that is available for us. So, let me explain what head reaction cells are about. If I you record from a head reaction system uh, cell in my brain, and I turn my head around 360 degrees, then a set of neurons, like uh, around the ring, start firing, they are active for a while, they stop, another group of cells are active, then they stop, and so on. For every single degree, there will be some set of neurons that will be active. And this is, of course, not a magnetic uh, interaction, because if you take it to another room, the same cells as the set of cells will be active, but now the magnetic uh, node will be somewhere different. It is just a, a 
reference frame to this particular environment or to another environment. So, why am I choosing this particular example? If you look at the, the, the list of Aristotelian senses and you look, look at the list of uh, the, the, uh, the William James uh, book, what you can find is that, yeah, we have uh, you know, four or five senses, but who, who made this up? We have others and lots of other senses that we don't know about, such as you know, direction of sense or sense of direction, which is uh, when the direction system is involved. This is the simplest possible sense for the following reason. When we are dealing with vision, we have to worry about lots of things, such as color, orientation, selectivity, and, and a bunch of other things. When we are dealing with, the, with the, some other sensations, then of course you have to worry about the intensity and other things. Here, there is no intensity, no other modality, no other complication, except the degree where you can get. So, it's a fantastic system to study, and you can ask what is driving the system. And people over the years studied many, many things. Um, vision is one of them. Some other sensation is another one. Feedback on the muscle is another, the third one. The vestibular system is a very important part of it, and so on. So, you can ask what happens if you take all this away. What will happen to neurons that are part of the head direction system in the brain if you take all the inputs away. And this is so simple to do, all you have to wait until the animal falls asleep. In that case, the animal loses its body, it loses its inputs, the entire brain is, is all alone. So this is an example. Uh, in order to study the relationship between them, you have to put electrodes, try to fit electrodes into the right spot. In this, in this particular case, it's the enterodosal nucleus of the thalamus. There are many big neurons that are encoded from this particular nucleus here. At the same time, you can put LEDs on the head of the animal, and you can track which direction the animal is looking at. And that would be the, the red face here. Now, taking these internally recorded neurons, you can make a training program that trains the neural activity based on the head direction in a supervised manner to predict which direction the animal is looking at. And that's the black one. You can see that the black and the red are very, very similar. If you have a dozen or so neurons, especially if you have two dozen or so, you can very precisely reconstruct it. It's because it's such a simple thing. Now we can ask the following question. What happens if the animal falls asleep, or in this case actually goes asleep before? And the answer is, depending on where you are looking at. If it's no REM sleep or REM sleep, it's slightly different, but it is not disorganized at all. In fact, it is super well organized. You can see here is that in the waking state, the animal's head moving around, there is a nice pattern, and that pattern <coughs> during REM sleep is pretty much the same. You can see that they, it goes from the red to the blue, and so on, so in the opposite direction. <coughs> this is, may not be so clear that the next figure I will show you, but, but you can see that, that during non-REM sleep, this is not disorganized either. So what does that mean? It means that representations of 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 50 degrees, 60 degrees, and so on, are always following each other because of the physical constraints of the animal, then it can move the head on in this direction. During sleep, the representation of 30 degrees is always before 40, it's always before 50, and always before uh, 70, and so on. And that's the case both for REM sleep and during non REM sleep. In other words, during REM sleep, we can figure out which direction the animal is looking, even though the head is not moving in any direction. Now, the difference between REM and non-REM is that during non-REM sleep, this trajectory, this ring, is moving 10 times faster. And in fact, that's an interesting thing, because we already know from other uh, experiments in the hippocampus and the, and the, the neocortex that indeed there is an acceleration of replay of activity of, of waking state. And this obeys the same rule. So here's an example. Now we are looking for, for activities of pairs of neurons. In this case, let's say I'm looking at this projector over there, and there are two neurons that are active and tuned into the projector. They are overlapping in space there, or they are overlapping in time. When I turn my head, whenever I'm looking at this direction, they are temporarily correlated. Now if I have a, another neuron, another neuron pair, one is the projector, the other one would be the the, the, the door entrance. They are spatially discontinuous from each other. The probability that they will fight together in time is, is zero, very small. In fact, they are anti-correlated. 
So now if you have a group of, of, of patterns that are positively correlated, and there's a group of patterns that are negatively correlated, then there should be an intermediate state of zero correlation. Okay, so this is what we are looking for, and indeed, in this case, you can see this is pretty flat. So this is a so-called cross gamogram a cross correlation into the euros, and you can see the time scale. The Euring gram, this is pretty much the same pattern as during the waiting state, but during slow wave sleep, this is 10 times faster. So these are three representative pairs. We can have many, many hundreds of pairs, and the rule is pretty much the same. And you can see these pairs are very positively correlated, these pairs are negatively correlated, and the ones that are uncorrelated happens to be those that are 60 degrees from each other. Why is 60 degrees an interesting number? Because? Okay, are you an engineer? <laughs> Nobody? Exactly. So the grid cells tessellate the environment with hexagonal shape that has an equilateral triangle. And people have been looking for the solution and the mechanism for the 60 degree in the antenna cortex. But then it turned out in the hands of the Mosers that there are other places such as the Prisipu group, Prasipu group, and now uh, Tim Barrett in the, the University of College London found it in recontour cortex and many other places. So it's, it seems to be substrate independent and it, we don't know where they are coming from. This is one very important possibility. And the reason why it's an important possibility is that the grid system is completely dependent on the head direction system. You make a lesion, in the other goes on because of the thalamus, and there are no, no bit cells anywhere in the brain. So this is a very important area, and in fact it's so important that it's not only in the anterior dosa because of the thalamus, but many other places of the brain that are with the brain that are these head direction cells present. So Besides William James, there was another equally famous uh, British physiologist, his name is Sherrington. How many of you have heard from Sher about Sherrington? Or, okay. Do you remember the writing reflex from Sherrington? It's a very uh, basic reflex. He was very much interested in what happens when he threw up a cat and the cat landed. And the cat always lands on its nose. And that, of course, is an exciting thing to him. So what he did is to say, oh, maybe it's the vestibular system. So he destroyed the vestibular system, threw up the cat, the cat lands. That's a disappointment. And then he tried something else. And then he, he cut the neck muscles, blindfolded his animal. He did a lot and lot of manipulations until about six, seven, eight maneuvers. He made sure that the the cat was on the side on the floor, and then you had the weight on the other side, which was equal than the weight of the animal, and eventually did it right up. But he made a very important conclusion that those things that are very important for survival are represented in multiple places in the brain. Now, if his rule applies, then indeed the direction system is very important because you find the direction systems in the brainstem, in the mammillary bodies, in the anterior dorsal nucleus of the thalamus, in the prosopiculum parasubiculum, entoronal cortex, parietal cortex, prefrontal cortex, lateral septum, and the list goes on. So they are represented in multiple, multiple places. So if they are, then we can make a prediction how the information from one area can go to the other area. So for example, we can record from the AD nucleus of the thalamus of bunch of cells, and we ask, can the population activity in this upstream nucleus predict the timing of a single <coughs> neuron's actual potential the downstream prosopicular area. And of course, prediction can be done with many neurons, few neurons, and in a short period of time and a long period of time. So once you have a tool like that, you can also ask, what is the best time window? And the most important thing that you can ask in this context is that how much of this prediction relies on the external world, and how much is this elaborated internally by the brain? So this is what we have done. You can see that these are the readout time windows. It happens at about the oscillation time is when the, the best readout occurs. And if you compare, and of course if you want to make prediction, when is the best time to make prediction? No wonder the waking state is the winner. Because we have the eyes, we have the vestibule, we have everything. But look, if you compare how much 
gain you had with external, it's all about one third of the information that comes from the, from the body and from our sensors. Two thirds of the information is already generated into the brain. In other words, this knowledge in the mammalian brain, already in the small mouse, already got internalized tremendously. Why is it good? It is good because I can close my eyes anytime I want and I don't lose my sense of direction. I can interpolate and I can extrapolate. The, inter the entire goal of all this complication, it had more and more and more and more loops, is nothing else, it's just to make prediction better, which requires interpolation and extrapolation. So this was my second example of uh, showing that this is a very useful thing to internalize things from the outside world, because this is a prerequisite for computation. Now let's go to something more complicated. What I'm showing you here is five place cells in the hippocampus. Place cells are called place cells because they are active in particular parts of the environment. So when I walk from here to here, then a group of neurons will be activated here, and then a little bit later, another group of neurons, another group of neurons, place cell one to place cell five. Why are they firing? Well, the idea is, the original idea of my fellow people is that the constellation of the environment somehow, for example, the corner of this uh, podium here, is activating P1. Again, the idea is that it's a Newtonian brain. In order to make actual potentials occur, you have to drive the brain from the outside. And no wonder, when you move from here to here, these neurons will be sequentially activated, because the sequence is imposed on the brain by the outside world. So this is one way of thinking about it. However, many of you also know that the hippocampus is not only about spatial navigation, it's also about memory. In fact, if, I, if that was the entire story, then I wouldn't be able to give this talk. Because I'm giving this talk to you with a little bit of help from the, my, 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 uh, my slides from the computer, but most of it I could give it blindfolded and without any external help in the brain, uh, outside the brain. And the reason why we can do this feat is because when Eva introduced me, it generated an initial condition in my brain. It generated the activity and assembly of neurons, and this assembly of neurons gave the information to another set, which in turn gave the information to another set, and another set, and another set, and then the cell assembly sequences keep me active in my brain forever. As long as I've been waking, and even after I fall asleep, the sequences just keep going on. So this is another way of thinking about it. Then in fact, the hippocampus just cannot help. It generates sequences. But of course, there are many sequences, some of which, through experience, become useful. There's, there's a, their, their internal generated parents will be matched to a useful outcome. So let me show you, well, summarize 30 years of very, very hard work by the best people in this field, uh, especially a single neuron called behaves, and uh, many of you have seen pictures like this or movies like this. This neuron fired here. And then you can convert the firing activity into a map, or actually the map here, this is the placement of the neuron. If you're a little bit, if you are a little bit more careful, you can listen to the neuron and say, oh, it fired actually rhythmically. And uh, I think there is one more trial, you can listen to its uh, rhythmicity. Now, at this particular trial, the neuron fired 7.7 hertz. All the other neurons, which we are not hearing, are doing something similar. Their membrane potential fluctuates at the same frequency, but you add up all these extra standardly available uh, currents, and you measure this trace here called local field potential, its frequency is about 7 hertz. So now we have everybody lumped together at 7 hertz, and we have one who is 7.7 .7 hertz. Now we have two oscillators with a non-integer relationship between the two. So when it happens, then we have something good. We have an interference pattern. And once you have interference, you've got temporal precision. Now this is very useful, very interesting, because at the time I became super interested in this, in this problem. It's not only place phenomenology, but time entered into the picture, and time is necessary for memory. To my surprise, advocates such as John Pibley use this beautiful finding 
to further support that the hippocampus is about nothing else than a spatial map. Why is that? Because we observe the animal. Let me explain. So when the animal enters the field, this actual potential occurs on the peak of the field cycle. Then the animal moves into the middle of the field, then the actual potential is on the top, and when the animal moves this place, then the actual potential phase uh, keeps recessing. And this is about the 360 degree recession. These are the data cycles shown three times, and this is the position of the brain. In other words, it's enough to take a snapshot of one single data cycle, which is about 100 millisecond, ask where the neurons are firing, and take this information as a prediction where the animal is. So this is wonderful, because this is good for something. Now, there is something fishy about this interpretation. The fishy thing to me is that how is it possible that the here and now is determined by the external world only? Because the external world is out there, whereas the theta written, the oscillation is generated in here. And the two are not in sync. Every single time the animal runs through, it's a different phase. So how is it possible that distances can be determined with the help of the external environment? We will come back to this problem in a second. Now let me just summarize so, oh, you know, several years of work saying that oh, the two fields are not contradicting each other. Namely, that there is spatial navigation, the hippocampus is good for that, and there is memory, the hippocampus is good for that too. So why is that? So think about this way. Nature initially worked out the method to use the external environment to help the animals to navigate its surroundings. When those loops are getting more and more complicated, and the information can get more and more internalized, then we can do what we can call mental travel. Memory is nothing else but traveling back into the past. Planning, <coughs> imagination, is planning into the future. But in fact, it's relying on the same exact subject. So the only difference is that in one case, the external environment is driving the hippocampus, and we are talking about spatial navigation. In the other case, it is memory when it relies on nothing else, just the initial condition that is triggering a pattern, and that pattern travels in these n-dimensional spaces that I will show you in a second. Now, the good news is that there, there are two ways to navigate. Every animal does that. The first one is what you can call exploration. It's also called that reckoning part of navigation. You can bring me into this room blindfolded, I can walk around and without that help and I bump into this corner. Then I can come back from another direction, uh, I bump into this corner, again they said, oh, I came from two different directions, I've got something familiar here, I call it a node. <coughs> and then I do the same thing and keep exploring until I have more and more nodes and I memorize the relationship between the nodes I can go out, switch off the light, make a map, and give it to somebody else. And if I made that map, then anybody else can use it. In other words, one, is, one kind of, of, of navigation is egocentric. It's all about me. It's all about my private property. But I can give this information to everybody else once I made it a semantic type of information. So in order to explore the world, you need to start with this one. Once you have that, you can build a map. The good news is that <coughs> memories also come in two flavors, at least in hippocampus dependent memories. One is what we call egocentric or episodic memory. These are all our precious properties. Uh, they, without, without, without them, we are just zombies. We are not individuals. We have to have our memories. Now, in order to go from my own experience to more complicated, non self preference or non-egocentric or allocentric memories, this is called semantic information, we have to collect the information. In other words, when the first time you meet a dog, when you're a child, then it's an experience. But then you see a lot of dogs, and then this entire thing becomes just a dogness. That is the concept of the dog, stripped down from the conditions of the spatial, temporal conditions in which you accounted them. Or when you discover something in the laboratory, that becomes an episode for you because it lasts for you forever. Everybody's entitled to one or perhaps two discoveries in this over life. So we'll never forget that. But if my laboratory confirms your finding, and another laboratory 
confirm the finding. A lot of laboratories from different directions will confirm it. It becomes a simple fact. It becomes a semantic information. So this was the easy part. The rest of it is just illustrations. So this shows the, uh, uh, why the hippocampus is so special, what we can do, what is so different from the neocortex. The hippocampus is a single, giant cortical, man, uh, cortical module. It grows just like that. It's the same kind, the same architecture in every single species. It's not a modular structure like the neocortex where the columns are coming and, and multiplying. It just grows. It is connected to a lot of other neurons. <laughs> And the interesting thing about it is that if you're looking for a, for a random graph in the brain, that is how you can go from anywhere to anywhere else in, in just a few steps, this is your best bet. The probability that this neuron is connected to its neighbor or somewhere else, far away, is pretty much the same. There is no other organization anywhere in the, in, in the, in the neocortex like that. Now, there are interesting numbers here. A single neuron has about uh, about uh, uh, half a meter of axons. There are 200,000 of these partners all together. It's 40 miles of axon. It's tremendous amount of connectivity in a structure which is only 10 millimeter long. In other words, there are 10 billion connections, 10 million possible uh, storage uh, size here. There's other synapses. And you can go from any synapse to any other synapse in just two steps because of this strong connective graph. And these two steps takes no more than just about 100 milliseconds, which is a theta cycle. So this is a graph that is capable of looking up any combination of information. It generates a sequence. That sequence knowledge is pretty poor because it doesn't contain all the information you want to have. But it can point to the corresponding parts of the, the cortex, just like a good librarian, and said, oh, the content of this information is in this book, and this book, and this book, and this book, and you can concatenate those books, and you can make a wonderful story. Uh, there are lots of complications, but the stock is at the clock, and so I have to move a little bit faster, if you don't mind. Okay. Oh, good theories are good theories because they can make good predictions. Every single theory is solid because it makes, makes testable predictions. So John O'Keefe's uh, navigation theory is a wonderful theory because it makes predictions. Namely, what the prediction is, it's the following. If somehow you can freeze an animal here and now, there should be always a set of cells that will be fired in the hippocampus forever, as long as the animal is here and now, and if by some magic we maintain the hippocampal data oscillation. The second prediction is, there are several predictions, but this is the most fundamental. The second one, those small number of neurons that happen to fire here now, they should always fire on the same phase of theta cycle forever, as long as that animal is not moving from here to somewhere else. And this is something that people can be tested. The way how we can test it is that we train an animal to run in an environment like this, it's a T-maze, the animal is rewarding with water here, it has to remember that next time it has to go in the opposite direction. It has to automate the choices. The only new thing that we introduce here is that in the delay area, we ask the animal to run always in the same direction and with the same speed. So in our power, we have done everything that you can imagine that the, the information from the outside world and from the body remain constant. Okay, now we are making the prediction. The prediction is that we should find some neurons in the hippocampus that will fire as long as the animal is running in the wheel with its head fixed in space. And of course, this is not what we find. What we find instead is this. So these are four separate neurons. These are 50 trials. And you can see that this neuron, here the red colors means the activity, neural activity, as in many other presentations that I have seen today. And this likes to fire about one second into the journey. So now this is not distance, but this is time in the wheel. And you can see very nicely that there are neurons that fire on different. Then you can collapse this information into a session average, and then this is what you can get. So this is a neuron that always fired at the beginning. If you have enough number of neurons recorded simultaneously, then the entire journey can be tessellated. The interesting thing, of course, is that if you look at the lifetime of these neurons, that is how long they are active, one or the other. They, are, they have pretty much the same lifetime as 
the play cells when animal is running around freely in the environment. In fact, I can give this data set to any experts of, of, of hippocampus, and they will, be not, they will not be able to tell us at all whether the animal is navigating in the environment or, in fact, is not getting anywhere. Because it's anywhere. Now, the good news is, the exciting thing about it, that this trajectory, you can call this a neuronal trajectory, which is nothing else but an activity packet traveling in this n-dimensional space of this CA3 collateral matrix that I showed you in the anatomical picture. And if the initial condition is the same, then the same pattern will be initiated. And we can just assume that another initial condition will generate another very unique trajectory. It's very simple for us here because there are only two conditions, the animal came from the right or the animal came from the right. But we have about 50,000 unique episodes, so that would be 50,000 potential trajectories that have to be separated. So let's see what happens when we look at one neuron, because what I'm predicting here is that this is a very useful thing here, because embedded in this trajectory is the animal's past and its future. So let's now examine one single neuron, and 